you know, the, I was sitting there as we were singing that song, and I'm like, that song, we're telling God, he, he doesn't need to know that. He already knows that about himself, right? Yeah. But isn't that what praise and worship does, though? It reminds us. As we bring glory to God, as we honor God, it's, it's a reminder to us. We are glorifying him, yes, but it's, it's a faith builder, right? Amen. So I just want to encourage you, as we're worshiping, just let the, let the truth, let the reality of what we're singing about, let it sink in and let it transform you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And if that doesn't do it, then the, uh, the smell of the chili might, right? Wow. So, uh, you know, we were going back and forth on, on where to uh, have our lunch after service. And, uh, you know, those who, uh, who are tuning on online, they don't, they don't know this about Fresno, but it can get hot in October, right? It's like, wait a second, I thought, I thought this was fall. But uh, it was supposed to be in the mid-90s today, so we decided to, uh, to have our lunch in here. So, so bonus, the aroma is pretty amazing, right? Please don't let it distract you from what God has for you this morning. Um, real quick announcement, if you look on the back of your brochure, uh, this is something that we're going to participate in again this year. We did it last year as well. Uh, 559 Yodas is, um, it's an off-roading club of uh, 4x4 enthusiasts that have Toyotas. And the club is huge, especially in Fresno, because we're, you know, an hour away from some pretty amazing uh, landscape and some off-roading opportunities. So it's, it's got a big following. And so last year we hosted, um, we provided our parking lot as a place for them to do their trunk or treat. So like they have all these amazing offer. They've like taken a normal Toyota truck and then just tricked it out. Right. So it's really kind of like a, like a car show meets candy. It's kind of a weird thing, I know, it doesn't sound, um, but, but I want to just encourage you. Um, it says that we need volunteers, and you see at the bottom it says, serve and smile from four to seven. So we need volunteers, okay? So I'm making a, a plea for you to come out that night, because this is an, a neat outreach opportunity, and I'll explain why in just a second. But don't come if you don't smile, So uh, somebody sent me a, um, a video of last week's sermon. They had taken the sermon and they had um, cut it down into kind of like a highlight reel and posted it to Instagram and they sent it to me and, uh, and, and they meant it as like, a, like an encouragement, but I looked at it and I'm like, wow, I was intense last week. Now, it's like, this is a reminder myself. Like, if we're going to serve, let's smile, right? So let's not, let's not be grumpy Christians, okay? Um, but let me tell you a little bit about this. I know I'm taking some time because I want us to understand something about this. Because we did this again last year, and I think probably about 150 people from this off-roading club came out to our parking lot and gave out candy, and we had a bunch of people around and all this stuff. Um, it was interesting, though, because we had um, this club here. They're giving away candy out of their trucks. And, you know, they're, some of them dressed up in Halloween, and some of the outfits were kind of scary and a little kind of like, does that represent a church well? And, and I want you to hear from my heart. It's, he, here's the deal. Like, we're not trying to promote Halloween. We're not trying to promote things that are like pagan and stuff like that. That's not it. This is an opportunity to reach this club. They're coming on a church campus. They're going to meet somewhere, and they need a safe place for a family-friendly uh, environment. And so we opened up our church, and, and many of you who were there last year, it was a neat opportunity. But I'm just saying, I want us to use this as an opportunity to show them Jesus. This is not a church, this is not the Vine Church having a trunk or treat. Because if it were, I'd probably do things just a little bit different. 
So, so before we had some people show up and it was interesting. We, um, again, this is a club and I want us to view this as we are reaching out to the club. Okay. And that means we love people in all of their messiness, right? Because we had a truck and a guy that showed up last, last time and, and he had this big flag outside of the back of the truck and it says, let's go, Brandon. Only it didn't say, let's go, Brandon. You know, and so it's like, well, wait a sec. So I, I went and I had a conversation with him and he changed out his flag. He happened to have like six different flags. I'm like, wow, how convenient. Um, but, <laughs> but here's the point. Let's not judge. Let's not, let's, and if you want to invite friends, that's fine. We would love for that. Like if you, if you want to, you know, you got family and friends and neighbors that, you know, want to come and see some really cool off-road trucks and get some candy and dress, that's all great. If you invite people, invite them and rec, and, and don't say our church is having a trunk or treat in case there's a let's go Brandon flag, okay? Say our church is hosting the 559 Yodas. And let's look at this as an opportunity to be missional. Amen? So do two things for me if you could. Between now and it's, in two, it's two Saturdays from yesterday. It's a week from Saturday. Um, bring some candy next week. Uh, or take it to your small group this week. And your, your uh, small group leaders will bring it to the church. So bring us some candy and pray about coming and serving and smiling at 4 o'clock on the 22nd. And let's show them the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Okay. We're going to get right into it, and I'm going to try not to be intense this week in case somebody happens to be filming a highlight reel. But if you were here last week, we talked about fasting. We talked about fasting, and I shared with you uh, out of Daniel chapter 10, and we'll briefly peek at that again today. But I shared with you that Karen and I, my wife and I, were inviting you to participate with us. We're inviting our church family for a three-week Daniel fast starting tomorrow through the end of the month. 21 days to press into God. To, uh, in Daniel chapter 10, we looked at it last week. Uh, a lot of people look at this, this, this passage where Daniel said, this is, this is what I gave up. I, I didn't drink wine and I didn't eat meat and I didn't eat um, delicacies for, for three weeks. And he, he pressed into God. He humbled himself and he pressed into God and God showed up. God sent him a message. And it was powerful. And, and you know what? When we look at that, I, I just want to say, you know, Daniel never set out to say, I'm going to do a 21-day Daniel fast. He didn't even know it was going to be 21 days. He set out to humble himself, to press into God because he wanted to hear from God. And he wanted to push some distraction away and he wanted to press in. And we only know it was for 21 days because he finally got the message. 21 days later, an angel showed up and said, there's been spiritual warfare for the past three weeks, but I'm here and I have a word from God for you. And so what we're doing is we're, we're just inviting you to step into this moment. And just say, we want to humble ourselves and we desperately, desperately want to hear from God. And so we, uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at that a little bit more today. Last week we looked at it, but, you know, ha fasting is called a spiritual discipline. And we don't talk about spiritual disciplines that much, probably because it doesn't sell. It's got the word discipline in it. So, like, that's no fun, Right? But if we recognize what God is calling us into, and he's calling us into uh, this walk, this relationship with him. And so a lot of times we look at these things like spiritual disciplines. We look at praying or we look at fasting and we're like, oh, this is something that I have to do. I don't want to do. And we miss the point. We really miss the point and that this is helping us hopefully to grow closer to Jesus. It's not about checking a box. It's not about impressing anybody. In fact, it's interesting because um, fasting is talked about a lot in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament too. 
And this isn't in your uh, notes, but I just want to open us up with this word right here. This is in, in Matthew chapter 9, and it's interesting because people are coming to Jesus and they're asking about fasting. You see, the assumption is that religious people, people that want to like press into God, the assumption is everybody's fasting. And they can't wrap their minds around something. They're like, well, wait a second. You say you're the son of God and and your closest followers, they're not even fasting. So how does that compute? And it says this in Matthew 9, verse 14. It says, then the disciples of John came to him saying, you know John the Baptist, right? He was like the Elijah that came out in front of Jesus. Like he's the one that, that said, make way for the Lord. He's the one that baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit fell on Jesus. Like, like these, these are like not like, like just kind of like your average, just like quasi-religious people. These are followers of John and they're like confused and they come and they said, they came to Jesus and saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can, a, can wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them what jesus is saying is like there's this this i am i am with my followers in a very unique way right now i'm physically present we are like doing life together there's an intimacy about our relationship right now we are together is this is this a time when you like like you mourn and you you humble yourself and you press into fasting he says you don't do that But he says this, the days will come when the bridegroom, he's talking about himself, is taking away from them, and then they will fast. You see, the assumption that is made, and we're going to look at another place where Jesus talks about fasting again. The assumption is that people who are followers of God, that this is a part of the rhythm of their walk with him. When I'm not physically with them, that's when they're gonna, that's when they're gonna fast. So this morning I want to continue on where we talked about last week and I want us to unpack it. And this is, you know, you know me, I love I, I love to be like a teacher. And I love to like challenge and, 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 and exhort us. Uh, today, this is gonna be a little bit more pastoral. This is like, come on, guys, let's do this together. And so I want to talk a little bit more from where we picked up last week, but, but let's go to the Lord and let's ask him to, to anoint this time. God, we come before you and we thank you for your word. God, we love you and we thank you that there is this beautiful relationship that we get to have with you. And God, for, please forgive us when we, we make it about religion and we make it about do's and don'ts and we take all the love out of it. God, help us to understand from your word today. Will you challenge us? Will you draw us into you? God, will you take us into deep waters? I ask, and everyone said, amen, amen. So this past week, um, Karen and I were uh, kind of winding down and and, uh, we were thinking about watching a movie, and I don't know, am I the only one that sometimes you stroll through the streaming services like as long as a movie sometimes? You know, it's like you have three or four different streaming services, and then there's like all these different genres, and and you're just spinning, and you're spinning, and you're like, wow, it's been 45 minutes, and we're just like looking at things that we might want to look at. So it was one of those things, and I'm starting to get a little sleepy, and um, you know, this is showing my age just a little bit, and I hate that. I hate that I'm getting gray in my beard, and I hate that what I'm about to share with you is happening on a more frequent basis, and there's this, we started to watch a movie, and we finally picked one, right? We made the mistake of like starting the movie to watch it while we were in bed. Some of you who are of the older generation know where I'm going with this. So there was a time when if I started a movie at nine o'clock, I would probably be looking for the second movie after that. Now when I'm starting a movie at nine o'clock, I don't know if I'm going to make it. 
Some of you are not laughing. You have no clue. You're a teenager. I get it. Okay, that's fine. So Karen and I, we picked this movie and we start watching it. And about the first 30 minutes of the movie is all about character development. It introduces the three main characters of this movie. And the, and the first half an hour really kind of just basically introduces us to who these people are. We learned what made them tick. We learned about their heart. We learned about their personality. We learned a little bit about what got them to the place that they're at now. The first half an hour is all about learning who these people are. Now, sometime after that first 30 minutes, I think the action picked up. I have no clue because I fell asleep. But later I woke up because there was like some action scene or something like that and it's kind of loud and I wake up for the last 10 minutes of the movie. Now Karen, who's, I guess she got her sleep the night before, whatever, she's watched the whole thing. I got the intro, the part where we learn who these people are and then I got the last 10 minutes. Guess what? I learned the outcome. I learned how the story ended, but I missed everything in the middle. But when I was thinking about that, because I was like, was it a good movie? I kind of really liked these characters, and, 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 and now I know how it ended. Do I need to go back and watch this? Obviously not tonight, but do I need to go back and watch this movie? And as I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know what? I actually saw the most important parts. And and it, it kind of hit me, there's a spiritual truth to that. Because really, when we are talking about biblical reality, when we're talking about who God is, really the most important thing is this, that we know who he is. That we're introduced to him. We know his character. We know his heart. We know what he likes and what pleases him and 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 we know we know him and then the other part is we know how the story ends amen but there's a lot of the in between which is great and there's nothing wrong with that but i'm going to suggest that sometimes the in between can be very distracting from the key things. The key things is who is God? What's he like? What's he say about me? What's he say about himself? What's his nature? What has he done for us? And then how does the story end? Praise God in victory, right? Because of the cross. All my sins are washed away, um, no matter how bad it gets. We just got done wrapping up a, a sermon series in First Peter, and it talks about persevering in the midst of suffering. And it's like, no matter how bad it gets, there's this living hope that we know how the story ends. But sometimes in that middle part, we get distracted. And so where am I going with this? I, I want to suggest that it's easy to do, and we're going to look in a moment, we're going to look in the gospel where, where, where Mary and Martha are contrasted, and Mary is at the feet of Jesus. She's getting to know him. She's listening to him, and Martha is super distracted. Jesus actually says, you are really distracted. And sometimes we get really, really distracted. Am I the only one? who's had seasons in my spiritual journey where I just, I feel like I'm distracted. So what I'm suggesting today is that one of the ways to sharpen our hearts and to get our spirits sensitive to God and get back to that first 30 minutes of the movie where we, we begin to see God for who he really is and we begin to re- recognize and remember that this is a relationship, this isn't a religion. One of the ways that we can do that is by sitting at the feet of Jesus. And fasting helps us sometimes push out the distraction. So that's why as your pastor right now, I'm inviting you into this moment 
And it's not about legalism and it's not about this or that or the other thing. It's about can we as a church, can we press into this place where we allow some of the distractions to to shift away? And I believe fasting helps us with that. It reminds us again what this is about, who Jesus is, what he did for us and how he invites us to just know him and love him. So as a reminder from last week, I just want to read Daniel 10, verse 12. And again, I'm not going to go back and go through the whole sermon, but just as a reminder, Daniel decided to fast. He decided to press in. It's it's recounted at the beginning of chapter 10. 21 days have passed, and the angel comes to him, and and he says this, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand. And you humbled yourself before God. Your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. You see, the key right there is that, that, that phrase, you set your heart to understand. And you did what? You humbled yourself. You see, Daniel was longing to hear from God. Daniel was longing to understand in his heart. He, it was sincere. It wasn't trying to impress somebody. It wasn't trying to like, I'm, I did it two weeks last time. Let me see if I can go three this time. No, it was simply, I want, I want to understand. And he knew that part of pressing into God was humbling himself. And so he decided not to go, you know, like Jesus did in the wilderness for 40 days, he decided, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna set aside some stuff in this season. And he's like, I'm not gonna drink wine. I'm not gonna eat meat. I'm not gonna have del- delicacies. I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, some people look at that and then they look at Daniel chapter one where at the very beginning of his ministry, Daniel decided to drink water and vegetables only. And so they kind of look at those two and they combine them and they're like, you know, a Daniel fast is just veggies and water. I, I don't, I'm not, it's not about that. And it's actually, there's no such thing as a Daniel fast. What we see here is a pattern in scripture of somebody who longed to get close to God and they decided to set aside some stuff for a season to sharpen their spiritual heart and understanding and awareness. And Jesus, you know, quite frankly, he, he assumes that his followers are going to fast. You know, I read that in uh, Matthew 10, but also in Matthew 6 and verse 16, it says this, and I love this, because by the way, um, there's no commandment in scripture to fast. There's no commandment for followers of Jesus today for you and I to fast. In the Old Testament, there were for a season, for a particular purpose and a particular season, they were called as a nation of Israel. They were called to observe some, some annual fasts. Um, but but if, the, if you look at Scripture today and you look at the balance of Scripture and you try to say, okay, is that for us? No, God's not calling us like he called the nation of Israel to an annual fast where it looks like this or that. It, it, and yet fasting is all throughout the Old Testament. It's all throughout the New Testament. But by the way, I challenge you, look for a commandment that says you have to fast because there isn't one. But I'll say this, the assumption is that Followers of Jesus will fast. We see one of those examples in Matthew 6, 16. It says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like hypocrites, for they disfigure their facing, that their, their faces so their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So what Jesus is saying right here is like, hey, you know what? This isn't about something where you get another spiritual notch on your belt. This isn't about trying to impress people. And he's like, you know, those people that like, that go around like, oh, I'm fasting right now, you know, because they're trying to impress people, they got their reward. If they wanted to know people, if they wanted people to know that they were fasting, mission accomplished. But Jesus is saying, when you fast, don't do that. But by the way, did you catch when Jesus said, When you fast, it's not if you fast. 
or maybe sort of if you're thinking about it, it's like when you fast. And he goes on to say, when you fast, verse 17, but when you fast, he says it again. So when you fast, he says it twice, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. See, what Jesus is saying right here is, is there's, a, there's two key things that you and I need to take away from this passage. Number one, there's an assumption that we will fast. And again, I've, I've been here, I've been your pastor for a little over two years now, and I don't think I've ever preached on fasting. It's just not something that it's common from the pulpit. It's not something that I do. And again, this is not about, uh, this is not a commandment. And this is not really even about whether you're going to be saved or not. Don't, don't, don't hear that at all. This is not about me trying to twist your arms. This is about me trying to demonstrate to you the benefits in your walk with God. If you do this. So Jesus says, when you fast, so there's an assumption. But I want us to see the, this key. It says, the father who is in secret, he sees in secret, and he will reward you. Now, sometimes we read scripture really fast. And we're like, father who is in secret, he sees you in secret, and he'll reward you. Yeah, yeah, okay, moving on. Like, I know God's invisible. I know God sees everything. So obviously there's no secrets from God. Um, and you know, he, it's, he's going to re- reward us and okay. And moving on. Do you, this is a profound statement because Jesus is making a contrast. Jesus is making, and by the way, this could be about so many other topics other than fasting, because what Jesus is saying is people have taken something and turned it into routine. They've taken something that was very common in, in the people of God all throughout the Old Testament. Fasting, they took it. It's, again, Jesus is assuming that people fast, taken something that's very, very special and made it routine, made it religious, made it something else that I do on Sunday morning or fill in the blank. This is what Christians do. And Jesus is saying, wait, wait, reminder, God who sees in secret, he sees you. He sees you in this moment. So what does that tell us? Fasting creates intimacy. This is the God of the universe who, who wouldn't want to say, the God of the universe sees me? We know that. We, we know that from Scripture, right? But, but don't you want to feel that? Don't you want to feel like God sees me? God hears me. Have you ever been at a place in your walk with God where you feel like you're, you're more intimate with him than you have been at other times? You, you feel like I know God sees me. I know God hears me. It's like we're, we're, we're communing right now. It's like we're in relationship. There's this intimacy. There's, there's, can I just tell you, fasting helps, helps us in that area. It helps us be reminded to be in that secret place as you deny your body. At Daniel 10 talks about fasting as humbling yourself. As you get out of the way, As you humble yourself, as you set aside something for the very purpose of God, I want to grow closer to you. Don't you think that God will press into you? He will move towards you? We could go through countless scriptures, but last week we looked at Daniel chapter 10 and it says, because you set your heart towards me, because you humbled yourself, God heard you and I have come because of it. Do you see right there, there's cause and effect. Like, can you move the heart of God? Yes. Is God sovereign? Yes. Does God have to do what we say? No. How does all that work? I don't know. But I know this, God is moved when we press into him. And we're like, God, right now, I just, I just want to make it about you. I just want to make it about you. 
the Father who sees in secret will reward you. Like, this is in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Can I just say, this is not why you should fast. Just make sure you put an asterisk there. And if you're going to highlight this video, don't pull this out of context. Don't fast to get something from God. But I tell you this, God sees it and you will get something from God. There's too many places in scripture where people, here's, here's one of them, Ezra. Uh, I read this last week. Uh, Ezra says this um, in chapter eight. He, he needed God to help them physically. Like we, and last week we looked at some reasons that people fast. Um, we looked at, at Joel where the people had been in sin and they had been convicted and they knew that they deserved the wrath and punishment of God, but they were so sorry and they were genuinely repentant. And so in Joel, they called a fast. So there are times when we, when we, when we know we've kind of messed up and, 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 and we, we want to get back to that place with God where you know, we don't impress him or anything like that, but it's like an act of repentance. So in Joel, there was this time where, where they fasted out of repentance. And there's other times where you fast because you need something physically. You need God to move. And Ezra needed God's help. And in chapter 8, he, he calls a fast and it says this in verse 23. We fasted and we implored our God for this. Listen to this. And he listened to us. If you pull out all the scriptures in fa uh, fasting throughout scripture, you're going to see a common thread weaving throughout it. When you set aside your, yourself, when you set apart your time, when you decide to humble yourself or, or really press into God, you, you can see this theme where God does speak. He listens, he sees, and Jesus himself says the Father will reward you. So this is, this is why, as, a, as your pastor, like I'm longing for us to, to, to get to that place where we, we, our hearts are moved to move the heart of God. Like we, we are like Daniel where we're like, I'm going to set my heart to press into God and I'm going to humble myself. But what's interesting is that so many times we either mess this up because we make it about religion. And that's what Jesus is correcting there with, the, with John's disciples. He's like, um, you know, there's a, there's a time when I'm with you, when I'm with you, but, but, but when I'm gone, you're going to be fasting. And then also there's times where Jesus gives some coaching and he's just like, when you're fasting, don't try to do it to impress others. Don't make it about some kind of religious, um, you know, bragging right or something like that. So there's reasons that we should fast, but can I just tell you the most important reason, I think? Sure, if you need to repent, it's a great way, a great way to press in closer to God. If you need God to move, if you have your back against the wall, you're facing a huge decision and you need God to speak. Absolutely. But more than anything out there, I want to encourage you to fast because of what's in here. I want to encourage you because it's a way that you can grow closer to God. And a minute ago, I asked and there's quite a few hands like, have you ever had seasons in your life where you feel distracted? You've had a powerful encounter with God. You know that God is real, but you feel distant from him right now. There's a lot of noise going on. In Luke chapter 10, this is a really interesting moment where Jesus talks about something. He talks about how we love him. And you might know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan, and I'm not going to read the parable of the Samaritan because sometimes we jump right to that and we miss something that's powerful at the beginning. But listen to this in Luke chapter 10, in verse 25, it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him, that's Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, it is what is written in the law? How do you read it? 
And he, that's the, the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's your emotions. That's your feelings. With all your strength and with all your mind. And your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28. And he, this is the attorney, said to Jesus, no, Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself to Jesus, said, and who is my neighbor? And if you grew up in church, you know what happens next. It's the, it's the story, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus talks about that and how we should deal with others and how we interact in this world and, 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 and how we walk out our relationship with God with others. Okay, And it's a powerful, powerful parable. And you probably all know it, but... Can I, I want to show you something about human nature right here. Did you see how quickly this guy who's in conversation with Jesus, he's like, Jesus, how do I get right with God? That's what he's asking when he says, how do I have eternal life? How do I escape the judgment? How do I escape the second death? How, how do I get right with God? And then the answer's right there. And it's the, the first part is like, love God with everything in you. Love God with all of your heart. Love God with all of your emotion, with all of your feeling, with all your soul. Put your soul into it. Love God that way. Love God with all your strength. Love God with all your mind. But here's the interesting part. It's like human nature is shown right here because the guy like moves on pretty quickly. Like that in itself is a sermon. We could stop right there and that's powerful. But human nature is like, and he, and he just, he kind of brushes past that and he's like, uh, yeah, just point of clarification. Who's actually my neighbor? You see, we get into this pattern of wanting to do. Like, just tell me what the expectations are, right? Because Jesus says, love, love God. That's what the law says. It's like that, that you're in relationship. Now, how you treat others is how we walk that out in this world. And look how quickly he jumped to, what am I supposed to do when I encounter this guy? What am I supposed to do when this person treats me like this? What am I supposed to do? Who is my neighbor? How am I supposed to act? Do you see how he quickly moved from this place of relationship and love and intimacy in kind of like, tell me how I'm supposed to walk through life. What's interesting is right after this, in verse 38, Jesus has this encounter, and I mentioned it a minute ago, with Martha and Mary. So right after he has this encounter with this attorney who's trying to trick Jesus and saying, really, tell me how to please God. And Jesus is like, love God with everything and love others in the same way. Right after that happens this scene. Now, as they were on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with serving. It doesn't say that what Martha was doing was wrong. Man, she might have just been serving for the Lord. In fact, she was, because he was in the other room. But God, I've got to do this. I've got to do this for my small group. God, I got to do this. She was distracted with much serving. Again, this is not, it doesn't say she was distracted with a whole lot of sin in her life. It doesn't say she was distracted because she was just a really bad person. It says she was distracted with serving. It reminds me of what we read a few Verses before where this guy is like, God, or Jesus, how do I get right with God? And he's like, love God with everything and your neighbor in the same way. And he's like, okay, check, loving God. Okay, now, now what do I do? Jesus 
tells Mary she was distracted with serving. He, she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Isn't it easy to be anxious and troubled about many things right now? Anybody concerned about like the trajectory our country is on? Anybody concerned about what's happening in Fresno, what's happening in California, what's happening in the United States, what's happening around the world? Anybody concerned about that? What about your personal finances? Anybody concerned about 650 gas prices? So I, I, I get the Wall Street Journal. I can't help it. I used to be in business. I, I've not let that go. Um, so that's kind of like how I get a lot of my news. And it's, it cracks me up because uh, often it's talking about stuff that's happening in the economy. And it's like, and gra- gas prices hit a national average of $4.50 this week. And I'm like, I wish four fifty. That'd be amazing. Not here, not in California, six fifty. Isn't it easy to get anxious and distracted about a lot that's going on? And, and, and I'm not saying that we like put our head in the sand. What I'm saying here is Jesus is identifying, yes, there's distraction. He even says, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. He never says those are invalid things to worry about. He never says that. He just says this, Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. He's simply saying, look, what Mary has decided is she's going to press in right now. She wants to hear from God. Mary is described at sitting at Jesus' feet doing what? Listening. You know, Mary lived in the same world that Martha did. Martha was doing a lot of good things. It says she was serving. You know, the the young attorney, when he had this conversation with Jesus, if he went out and he started treating people well and he started loving them like the, the parable of the Good Samaritan said to love them, then great, awesome. He's living it out. Can I just tell you that serving in the kitchen like Martha did or loving other people like the Good Samaritan doesn't mean anything if you don't have a relationship with God. It means absolutely nothing if you've lost that intimacy. So what's the tie-in here? The tie-in is simply this. God listens to you when you cry out to him. Fasting is not the only way to cry out to him, but as we saw in Daniel. It says this. You set your heart to understand and you humbled yourself before God. I don't know about you, but I want us as a church, I want that to define us in this next season. I want us to be a church that, that is long. And I'm saying it's got to start with me. I'm, Karen and I, that's why we're inviting you to join us. We're not telling you, you got to do this. Just saying, this is what we're doing. Will you walk with us? Because this is my cry. This is the, I know this is the cry of God, that, that we set our heart to understand what is going on. We set our heart to understand who he is and what his plan and his purpose is for us. I want to be like Isaiah, who hears the marching orders from God, that God says, this is the way, walk in it. That He helps us to see around corners. I want to have the heart of God. And just like Daniel, like one of the ways that we do that, it's really hard to, to, to set your heart to hear from God and to be very distracted, to change nothing about your life. God, I, oh, I really, I, I want to hear from you. God, I want to hear from you. I need a fresh touch from you, God. I want to get spiritual goosebumps like I had 10 years ago. I want that, God. I'm not going to change a thing about my life right now. But it'd be really good if you showed up. 
Again, this is not a formula. This is not a, um, uh, you, you know, a, a, a vending machine Christianity. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when we humble ourselves and we quiet ourselves and we put ourselves at the feet of Jesus like Mary, when you look at the, the, the balance of Scripture, what happens? Multiple times, God shows I'm going to invite the worship team to join us. And we're going to worship. And, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not lost on the irony that we're talking about fasting right now and then we're going to have a chili lunch. <laughs> You're talking about fasting and it smells so good. We're not fasting today. We're starting tomorrow. Amen? This is not a formula. You shouldn't do this because you want anything other than to hear from God. I I just want, I want to be more like Mary. You know, those, those of you who know me, you know, I'm a little bit hyper. Obviously, on video, I can be intense. I'm a planner. I like to figure everything out. I want the heart of Mary. I want to sharpen my spiritual ears to hear from God. And when Jesus himself says this, when you fast, the Father who sees you in that secret place, there's an intimacy that takes place. It says the Father will reward you. My longing for all of us is this. We fall so in love with Jesus that some stuff just doesn't get done sometimes. Stuff is stacking up in the kitchen because Martha, she bailed and she's at the feet of Jesus too. I want to close with 1 John Chapter 4, verse 19. It says this. We love because he first loved us. What this means is whatever you and I do is simply a response to the overwhelming love of Jesus. He loved us first. We love him because of that. He loved us so much, he sent his son to die on the cross. So every single thing that I've done wrong, it's it's covered under the blood of Jesus. This is the God of the universe who says, I will meet you in that secret place. I will be in relationship with you. All we have to do is love him back. All we have to do is put ourselves in a position to experience his love. And I believe fasting helps put us in a position to hear from God and to feel his touch. So will you consider joining me and others in our church over the next several weeks as we take this step And we sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. God, we thank you for this unbelievable thing called love that you extend towards us. God, we cannot even fathom why you would want to be in relationship with us. God, forgive us when we take it for granted. Forgive us when we get so busy. Um, God, that we're just 
we're just checking off boxes and, and we, don't, we don't mean to, but we wake up one day and we, we feel distant. God, help us to be Daniels in this generation. Help us to be moved so much that we press in, that we humble ourselves and say, we need a word from you. Help us to set it all aside. God, we lift up our church. God, there's many needs that are represented in this room and those that are watching online. That there's many things that are, that are weighing on us, God, and, 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 and we want to give those to you, God. Help us not to be distracted by them. Help us not to be anxious by them. Help us to release them to you. Help us to, to walk in faith that you've got our back and help us just to breathe for a moment. God, will you stir us? Will you draw us? God, help us to love you because you first loved us. And everyone said, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to worship.